especially I would like us all to uh, hope for transcending material boundaries, which might start looking into perovskites, slowly uh, decreasing the dimensionality, going from the bulk to the 2D to the nanocrystal, uh, strongly quantum confined regime, and ending up with really novel materials that we haven't seen before that might be organic or other nature. And with this, I'd like to uh, discover new techniques with all of you that might help address uh, some challenges that lie ahead in the material sciences and vice versa. Also learn about novel materials that you might want to explore next with your specific uh, toolkit. And last but not least, it's really a bit about thinking outside of the box, which is why I decided to invite a lot of speakers to give short presentation rather than uh, focusing on a few speakers who present an entire paper because this is about pitching your ideas and, and uh, getting creative for our future work where physical contact, again, is not easily possible. So without further ado, I also give a little introduced talk about um, my own topic, which is about perovskites at the moment, even though I have interest in nanocrystals and organic materials as well. So here is work that I did uh, at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. And this is about the charge carrier localization in uh, thin films of alloyed perovskites and how this might be useful actually for both solar cell and LED device optimization. So um, just as a brief recap for those of you in the audience that do not actually work on perovskites, these are materials that you can see uh, displayed on the left that are formed of corner sharing halide octahedra with the bivalent cation, usually lead, sometimes also now tin and others, um, in their centers. And those octahedra themselves then are coordinated around an A-side cation um, in a cubic fashion, and this is uh, usually something like cesium or methyl ammonium. And to date, um, there have been plenty of uh, optoelectronic, the high-performing material uh, uh, devices based on these materials demonstrated, um, most importantly, solar cells that have now exceeded 25% efficiency, which is really astonishing, and um, also very efficient perovskite-based LEDs, as shown on the right. And my work really is concerned about connecting what makes these materials such efficient emitters, which again is helpful if, if no excited carriers are lost, that's also helpful for extracting them for solar cells, of course. So in a very brief uh, version of, of the paper I'm presenting here, uh, combining a variety of different methods, most importantly transient photoluminescence and transient absorption spectroscopy, we looked at a whole zoo of these different uh, materials, starting from the prototype shown here in gray, methyl ammonium lead iodide, or MAPI, all the way to the um, multi a site cation engineered uh, potassium and rubidium, cesium, MAFA-based um, high-performing materials. But very interestingly, we found that going from the MAPI to the mixed halide case, so either bromide, all of these materials show the same trend, which is upon photoexcitation, the charge carrier recombination mechanism changes dynamically from second order, which is bimolecular recombination, to first order, effectively first order. And this has not been shown to our knowledge before. And you would expect these materials to show only uh, bimolecular recombination because the external binding energy is very small. And so we expect to have electrons and holes freely moving in the material, having to meet each other to recombine and emit a photon. But tracing again the carrier density uh, via transit absorption, which then is implicitly shown in the x axis, we could actually see that there's a trend to the first order. Um, recombination, which we would usually um, only be able to explain with exciton formation or something like a doping term. Now we could outrule the exciton formation um, by some temperature dependent measurements and most importantly can very nicely see the implications of this phenomenon um, on the external photoluminescence quantum efficiency. So that's the amount of photons we can expect to get out per photon we excite the material with and that goes in. And we can nicely see here that um, whereas for the gray methylmonium lead iodide prototype, the PLQE uh, dies rather quickly if we excite too lowly and get into the uh, non-relative uh, regime. For all the other compositions, we level out at certain uh, PLQE values. Again, something that can be very nicely described uh, upon using a doping term in modeling these PLQE data. And then we get a higher PLQE out uh, depending on how 
uh, the A side cation engineering is used to optimize non-rative losses, of course. Um, we can even directly image this and um, we, uh, and we actually see in confocal photoluminescence mapping on the left that there is a modulation of the photoluminescence um, light energy. So this is in EV shown and not the intensity counts. And that there is micron or say a few micron um, large domains that really have a strongly different photoluminescence emission. And then if we map the same material with an electron probe microanalyzer, which shows us the X-ray fluorescence depending on the elemental composition shown on the right, we can actually really nicely reproduce these same domain sizes. And therefore we draw this picture shown in the center where there's dif different uh, band gaps locally in these thin films depending on the halide rich content of either iodide or bromide. And then in these, uh, so, so you might as well think of them as charged puddles, we actually accumulate charges in this case, mostly holes in the valence band modulation. And this is very efficient um, for the recombination from these high electron or hole density hotspots that then form. So this is already it from my side. In a nutshell, I've uh, just shown you all that these alloy cross guides show very high performance and especially high photoluminescence, um, even at low carrier densities, which we attribute to a change dynamically from the second to the first order of recombination due to this um, effective doping term arising from energetic disorder, which creates these charge puddles from where you can very effectively recombine the moment an electron uh, finds such puddles full of holes. And this is actually helpful, especially in the low carrier regime, where you then can still outcompete uh, non-rative losses. Um, that I'd like to thank all the people involved in this work, mostly in Cambridge and mostly my uh, first co-author, Stuart from Sam Strengths Group, but also, of course, my supervisors, Felix and Richard, uh, the funding bodies, and some pretty pictures on the right um, that have shown this.